Mountain Cover. What's this? Well, this is an interesting little uh, native from Colorado. This is Matt Penstemon or Penstemon tucreoides. So this is the same plant we saw this tall. That great big scarlet flower. Uh -huh. This is a uh, diminutive little cousin from Colorado. And this one not only is uh, drought tolerant and very pretty with the blue flowers, but it also makes a good ground cover. This plant over here is another one of the Penstemon group, Penstemon strictus, known as Rocky Mountain Penstemon, and it's one of the great big blue bloomers that we use very successfully uh, throughout the garden. Not only is it xeric, but it also adapts to uh, more conventional garden conditions. All of these plants in your xeriscape garden are perennials, is that true? Yes, these are all recurrent perennials are herbaceous, so they come back year after year. Some are more perennial than others. Many varieties might last for two or three years, then reseed themselves. Others uh, in this garden are five to ten years old, so some are very long-lived. Yeah. Well, show us some more of your favorites. Well, this is a, a nice little um, hardy marguerite. This is uh, Anthemus berbersteiniana. Kind of a mouthful for a small plant, yes, but <laughs> a real pretty little yellow daisy. The foliage is very ornamental, so even when it goes out of flower, uh, the foliage provides a nice uh, mat to keep the ground covered. It's a late spring bloomer. I, I think it's uh, important to, to point out to people that unlike uh, annuals, many perennials have a little shorter bloom period, say they over bloom a, all summer Exactly. Long. They might have a three to six week bloom period. So perennial gardens change in their color and composition over the course of the season. In fact, that's, uh, I think, part of the fun of it and part of the challenge of perennial gardening is, is uh, selecting groups of perennials that they provide continuous color mm -hmm. throughout the season. So as one goes out of bloom, something next to it comes into color. You seem to have several um varieties that look like they would be great ground covers. One of the problems we have is trying to shrink the size of our grass lawns, and these ground covers are a good solution for that, aren't they? Absolutely. Well, that's one of the principles of xeriscaping is to reduce or eliminate grass areas to really where they're essential. I think a lot of folks just use grass just to cover the ground. They really don't uh, uh, use it for uh, playing or picnicking on, they just use it to cover the ground. So instead, you can use some water thrifty ground covers, provide a lot more color than you might normally with the grass. Oh, yeah. And also save water. Can they take any foot traffic? Generally, what I recommend in terms of replacing lawn areas with ground covers are not really to be too concerned with the amount of foot traffic that they receive. What you can do is place stepping stones on areas that receive the traffic, and the, the plants might mash down a little bit, but you'll basically uh, create your own pathways where you don't walk on them very much, then they'll uh, grow vigorously. Have you got some other ground covers you can show us? Sure. Let's take a look at the some of the creeping times. This is rider time. This is just getting started this spring. Very vigorous. Chokes out the weeds real well. In oh. general, the creeping times are uh, make excellent ground covers. What is this plant? Well, this is a, a South African native that uh, was introduced to the United States about six years ago. And this is what's known as hardy yellow ice plant. Evergreen. The leaves get a very nice uh, red cast to them in the winter. Feels sort of like a sedum. Very much so. It's a very, very succulent, water-filled leaf. Uh -huh. But roots, very thick, uh, deep roots, so it's extremely drought tolerant. And cold tolerant? Very cold tolerant. <laughs> Again, I've seen this used in Vail, Colorado. It's typically rated to 30 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. So. It really can be used just about any place in the country. Its only limiting factor is it is very drought tolerant, so it sometimes has difficulty in very wet spots. Oh, but for much of the uh, western part of the country, it's uh, one of our best and uh, most vigorous ground covers. It looks like it, it would like the rocks as well. It, it loves to, to work itself among the rocks. Cascades beautifully, as you can see, over onto the gravel. Uh -huh. Is it rooting in the gravel, or is it just lying on top? It will root as it grows, so right. 
Uh, if anything, sometimes it's a little vigorous, but yeah. uh, put in the right spot, that's an attribute. Oh, yes, especially hot, dry, sunny spots where nothing it, else will exactly. grow. Exactly, this will thrive, uh, particularly yeah. in, in problem areas. Next to the ice plant, there's another silvery ground cover. What's this? This is a Canadian introduction called uh, Artemisia Silver Brocade. Another very cold hardy variety, good to about 30 below zero mm. Fahrenheit. All of the Artemisias really are invaluable in the Xeriscape garden because of their drought tolerance and they're just all around hardiness. This is a very nice low growing variety and as you can see the uh, foliage is one of its big selling points. Right. In general, the ground covers are very low maintenance. Uh, occasionally, in the instance of this Artemisia silver brocade and some of the other blooming ground covers, all they may require is that you just run the lawnmower over them on a high setting once after they finish blooming, and that's the only... Uh, if you want to. If you want to. Right. But uh, you don't have to. You don't have to. In fact, yeah. on the yellow ice plant, that's completely maintenance-free. Yeah. Uh, but some of them just might require a light trimming once a year just to keep them, uh, the foliage nice and to tight. Make them look better. Yeah. But other than that, the fertilizer requirements of these perennial ground covers is almost insignificant when compared to a traditional lawn. Yeah. A good fall feeding is typically all they'll require, particularly if you'll prepare the soil well before you and install the plants. And put a little mulch around them to... Put, them, put some mulch around to get them started, and then once they're off and going, they shade the soil uh, with their own foliage, and so they're basically kind of a living mulch. Yeah. What is this pretty little white ground cover? Believe it or not, that's actually a yarrow. Many people think of the yarrows as the tall garden growers typically in yellow, but this is a very hardy, drought-tolerant ground cover variety. This is a relative of the Artemisia silver brocade that we looked at. It's a ground cover variety. The Artemisias are also uh, commonly known as sages, which sometimes is a little confusing because sage is used to describe other plants. Artemisias are very useful in the uh, perennial garden. Not only are they extremely tough, but the, uh, this variety in particular, very fragrant foliage. Mm -hmm. Particularly after it rains, it perfumes the garden. Yeah. The gray foliage is also an excellent backdrop to other uh, bright green plants. Next to us here, this is a, a particularly nice variety for sandy areas. This is called sand sage or threadleaf sage huh. and the aptly named yes <laughs> very nice uh, soft texture again typically fragrant of the artemisias mm -hmm. then moving down here we've got a little different variety of artemisia this is artemisia arbortanum tangerine and this is commonly known as southern wood uh, popular in the herb garden uh -huh. An insect repellent, so it's useful for organic gardeners who like to... Mm, smells good. Yeah, it's a very strongly scented. But this one has a beautiful green color, which is a nice contrast to the typical gray foliage of the various Artemisias. Yeah. This is a Artemisia variety from the area of the United States, Artemisia cana, or silver sage. And again, this... One benefits if you just cut it back hard at the beginning of the season, then you get lots of this nice lush silver growth throughout the season. Mm -hmm. And you see how I've used it here with, uh, this is a native shrub, uh, New Mexico privet. So the gray foliage makes a nice contrast to the lime green leaf of the uh, New Mexico privet. Yeah. But they're really uh, the backbone of the perennial garden and certainly the xeriscape garden because they are all very deep rooted and very drought tolerant once they're established. When you say that these things are drought tolerant, that doesn't mean you can take them home from the nursery, stick them in the ground, and forget about them. That's a very good point. Uh, even the most drought tolerant of natives derive their drought tolerance from their extensive root systems. So they require a season's care and watering to reestablish that vigorous root system. And then many of the drought tolerant plants can be weaned off the water beginning the second or third season of growth. and then. Uh, many of the, the hardier ones can be, depending on the rainfall, left to their own devices.
The uh, artemisias are great background plants and, and lovely foliage plants, but, you know, we really love flowers. <laughs> are there perennial flowers? In great uh, profusion. There are many extravagant bloomers in the various perennial varieties that we can use in various parts of the country. Many of them uh, have incredible adaptability so they can be used over most parts of the country. This is a very exciting little rock crest variety from the mountainous areas of Turkey. In the morning it's very, very fragrant, palest pink, and it's also got a very uh, blue leaf to it, so even when it's out of flower, the blue foliage is very pretty. Yeah, but in bloom it's just solid. Just solid. Yeah, beautiful. And very xeric. This little section here is a little bit of uh, a, a rock garden section, and this is an area with particularly well-drained soil and particularly hot, uh, sunny exposure. This is one of my favorites. This little yellow flower here is a variety of Perky Sioux. The Latin name Perky on that. Sue. Perky Sioux. Perky yeah. <laughs> Very cheery, uh, sunny disposition Aptly there. Named, yeah. Blooms all summer. Likes to reseed itself. Uh, there are a lot of little volunteers starting to show up around the edges here. It's native, I believe, in uh, Arizona and southern New Mexico. One of my absolute favorites, extremely xeric. In fact, you've got to be careful uh, where you put it that uh, it doesn't get too much water, because once it's established, it grows here with almost no extra water at all. Here's another big bloomer over here. What's this? It's a favorite of mine. This is Salvia May Night. Beautiful color. Isn't that an intense purple? Uh-huh. Very easy to grow. Profuse bloomer, this one uh, with a little bit of deadheading, or another term for basically removing the spent flowers, yeah. will continue to bloom throughout the whole summer. The salvias in general uh, are a, a large group of native plants to uh, Mexico on up into uh, North America and are really well suited over a large area Easy, extravagant bloomers, one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. And again, take a little water and a little care. Exactly. It's uh, rather xeric. The salvias are known for their uh, pest resistance, so there are very, very few insect problems that ever pop up. And very neat, tidy habit. This May night is, I think, particularly tidy and tight in its, in its uh, growth habit. Here's an interesting little oddity that uh, comes to us from Romania, and this is Salvia Transylvanica. Ah. I playfully call vampire sage. I don't know <laughs> if it has anything to do with vampires, but again, a but very... But both from Transylvania. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Long blooming, likes to reseed itself. There's something rather exotic looking behind it. What are those? This is an interesting... Uh, variety that comes to us again from the uh, steppe areas of Asia Minor. It's Iramiris or foxtail lily. It is just coming into bloom here in about another uh, two to three weeks. Those spikes will be about two feet longer and they bloom from the base with a bright orange flower. Mm. Like the oriental poppy, they go dormant midsummer, so they just disappear from sight. You forget about them, but then without fail, each spring up they pop, pop back up they yeah. pop back up and what is this another good group of tough perennials this is one of the perennial cat mints this variety is, is uh, nepeta six hills giant it's one of the larger growing nepetas or cat mints hence the name uh, six hills giant this is a great one it blooms all summer the bumblebees particularly like it so it's a uh, pretty busy part of the garden during the day with the, uh -huh. bi the big bumblebees coming in for a visit but it's a nice contrast with the lemon yellow flowers of the uh, moonshine yarrow. I particularly like the cat mints. They've got a fragrant foliage. They're uh, oftentimes used in the herb garden. An important point on Six Hills Giant and some of the other varieties is that they don't reseed themselves. So unlike some of the uh, annual varieties that kind of make a weed of themselves, these mm -hmm. varieties, while vigorous, again, don't crowd out their less vigorous neighbors. Yeah. Another fine example of a uh, low care long blooming ground cover we see here along the edge of the pond that's veronica heavenly blue very profuse bloomer for about a month in late spring very low care and a nice glossy green foliage that 
covers the ground nicely when it's out of flower. What is that little yellow bloom over there? That's sundrops or callilophus. That's one of my favorite xeriscate plants because not only is it tough and drought tolerant, but it blooms all summer. So it really uh, helps keep the area colorful when a lot of things uh, might be out of bloom a little later in the summer. I've also noticed some ornamental grasses in your xeriscape garden. Well, there are a few good ones that work in the west. This is a, a particular favorite of mine. This is known as uh, blue avena grass. Very vigorous, deep-rooted, and the beautiful steel blue foliage is a wonderful foil for the silver artemisias. This is the silver leaf artemisia cana, or very good with other green-leafed uh, shrubs and perennials. This is one of my favorites, Judy. This is uh, a festuca grass, and the variety on this is sea urchin, aptly named because it is so uh, tight and compact. It does yeah. look like a sea urchin. Uh -huh. uh, again, very pretty blue foliage and makes a nice contrast, as I've used it here with the, the deep green of the creeping times. That's one of the nice things about these perennials. There's so many different shades, textures, shapes. It's, it's really fun to play with mixing and matching, isn't it? Very much so, I, and I think a lot of times uh, that's overlooked in terms of flower color, but there really is a lot to use perennials other than the flowers, and these examples here with the texture, leaf color. And it's so much more visually interesting than there's a bed of petunias. Very much so. I think <laughs> it's, a, it's a, a little more creative, a little more natural way to landscape a yard. It helps you follow the contours and doesn't give such a uh, artificial appearance sometimes. So I think a uh, perennial garden has that dimension that you don't always get with annuals. With the added bonus of being less work. Less work, and you don't need to replant them every year. So that's uh, certainly an advantage. This uh, little variety here is a uh, perennial gerrymander, or tucrium. And this is an evergreen variety that spreads by underground roots to make a nice low carpet of uh, stems. The key thing on the ground covers is because they do spread and root as they spread, that you prepare the ground properly in the entire area where you're going to be planting the ground covers. If you just prepare the soil with compost and whatnot in individual holes, the plants won't spread as readily between them because the soil will be less hospitable. Uh, I recommend a about a three to four inch thick layer of compost. Soil minerals like superphosphate, which is important for rooting and flowering. And in alkaline soils like New Mexico, we recommend a soil acidifier like soil sulfur. So once those ingredients have been spread and worked into the soil, say down to a depth of about eight to 12 inches, you're ready to plant, which is what we've got in this situation here. So let me just kind of demonstrate how we would start planting an area with the ground covers. We'd place them on approximately one foot center. So you just, the soil is soft and prepared, so really all you have to do is loosen the soil where you're going to plant. And I recommend a grid. With Rather than rows. You yes, so you can, I, I kind of like to put them on a slanted grid so it doesn't uh, look quite so formal to start and then with proper soil preparation and planting on one foot centers the homeowner can expect the plants to fill in within about a season or two depending on the variety mm -hmm. typically ground covers you'll start with a little smaller pot than you might with uh, other uh, specimen perennials whereas say on a, a moonshine yard you might start with a, a gallon container ground covers are typically sold in smaller units this is a a typical size, a two and a half inch pot. So, to get started, carefully remove the plant. One important thing that a lot of people forget to do is you need to cut through the roots that have grown to the side of the pot so that the roots will spread into the surrounding soil. It Otherwise, they stay in that same Exactly, shape. they tend to spiral and stay in the shape of the pot. So typically, the, the uh, identification tag has a nice sharp corner just score it a few times. Just score it down about a quarter inch deep, all the way on the sides. 
on the bottom, and if the roots are matted on the bottom, they can be pulled out lightly. Just tuck it down so it's level with the surrounding soil and firm. One thing I do not recommend is wetting or watering the soil while you're planting, particularly in areas with clay soils. This tends to compact the soil excessively, so when you water your ground covers, get them planted, then water them in. Do you put the mulch on before you water or after? I like to get the mulch on first, particularly on a, uh, a hill situation because the mulch will help the water percolate down into the soil rather than running off quickly when the soil is bare. Well, thank you, David, for sharing your Xeriscape garden with us and for telling us about all these wonderful plant options. Well, thank you very much, Judy. I've enjoyed the visit. It's been wonderful to see the different varieties of plants that will grow in temperatures up to 100 and down to 20 below. And many of these plants will grow in your areas, too. Check out hardy perennials. I'm Judy Barrett. We'll see you next time on The New Garden. For your own video cassette copy of today's program, or any one of the 64 other programs in the New Garden Natural Gardening series,